good, you know, going live. I imagine it's just on Twitter, so there's not many. So. Hey everyone, this is the first um, commercial open source office hours. I'm, I'm happy to do them every Friday. I'm actually completely booked into way until May, so it's pretty crazy. As uh, many many people uh, who were joining, um, so I'm excited to go live on. Actually, I think I'm also live on Algora, so that's pretty cool. Uh, it's like a developer first streaming platform. And um, yeah, I, I mean, first things first, um, I'm Pierre, co-founder of Cal.com. Um, been in, probably in startups for like the last 12, 14 years. Um, but um, I'd say most recently for the past three years in open source. Uh, and I really found a, a nice home here. I'm really enjoying it. I'm not a... I'm not a huge expert, you know, I've never taken an open source company public like GitLab, but uh, I, I know at least the early stage and I'm really interested in the early stages of, of companies as well. Um, and so I think this is a great place for you to ask, um, you know, product ideas or product feedback, fundraising advice, navigating, you know, large communities or, or small communities and um, everything else. So I think we can just start with some introductions so I, I know a little bit what what everyone's up about. Um, yeah, uh, Charan, do you want to go first? You, you were, you're still not muted. <laughs> uh, it's, it's me, right? Yeah, you can go first. Yes, uh, sure. Uh, so my name is Charan, and uh, previously I was a software engineer. I was an AI researcher for the past four years. Mm -hmm. I worked in places like uh, this Microsoft and Amazon. And after that, like recently, I've been working on this a uh, new idea which is uh, named by Permian, our company name is Permian.ai. You can check the website out. What uh -huh. we're essentially building is uh, we're trying to turn the boring static videos into a one-on-one -on -one live chat. And uh, we're doing this uh, by using the recent innovations uh, in AI. Uh, I, I can dive uh, more deep into it, uh, but th this is a short introduction. Uh, Cool. Uh, next one. Who wants to go next? Pontus. Oh, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> I think I muted you. Like, can I unmute you? Yeah, I think I do. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. Can I speak now? Yeah. Yes. All right. Perfect. So, so I'm Pontus. I've been an engineer for the past 10 years, uh, but just recently launched Midday and started that as a, a project from my own side, just to basically streamline my end-to-end -end process of handling my own businesses. Uh, but yeah, I open source it uh, last week. Been building it uh, on my spare hours for the past four and a half month, uh, but now going full time, of course, and yeah, really pushing this platform forward. So that's very cool. my, my mission. <laughs> very cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm on the wait list and I'm, I'm very excited to try the product. I think I actually started uh, signing up, but I didn't know if my co-founder, uh, we need to do like a compliance check on like where we connect our financial yeah. data. So I guess that's yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. 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 Cool. Kinja, do you want to go, for, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Kinjo. I was like building this uh, marketplace for all these startups to recruit talent to referrals club around 60k. And just been like a couple of weeks since I decided to pivot. And before that, I had a small exit and uh, I've built like consumer social with had like 50k plus users. Yeah, that's pretty much. And I moved to SF been like a couple of months, I dropped out of school. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> How was the experience so far? Oh, that that was fun. I mean, it's better than New York. <laughs> I, I don't like the nightlife, though. Yeah. Yeah, nightlife sucks in the south. That's true. Yeah. Well, it doesn't suck because it doesn't exist. So, but yeah, I agree. Yeah, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Cool. Zach, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, hey, I'm Zach. Um, I've worked on some open source master stuff recently. Um, I had saw that peers, um, you're at least like you've, you're on master, you don't post too much, but yeah, like you're interested in it. So I'm very curious to, um, hear your thoughts on like making a lot of these open source master clients, like economically feasible and, um, yeah, like your, your thoughts on the space in general. Yeah, I'm very, I'd say, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in the space. It's just, that uh, um, I think 
and it's 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 the worst thing about um, social networks. But like, you can have the best product, and people will still end up using Twitter or X because they have a following there, or they're just used to it, and it's you know muscle memory. So like, I think I'm very bullish on Lustre, especially with its focus on Bitcoin. But um, yeah, it's tough, and especially from a client point of view, it's even more interesting how to monetize that. Um, cool. Um, Okay, yeah. Uh, let's go into open questions. I know you have one, uh, Sean. If you want to go first, you were quite eager. Uh, yeah. So I think I uh, really want to know how uh, Cal dot com operates at the team level. So what are some things which assess apart uh, Cal dot com in terms of work culture in the team compared to any other companies? Yeah, um, so there's this interesting dynamic in open source where people ask, like, why are you open source? And there's many reasons, um, compliance and self-hosting and white labeling and developer friendliness. But um, I'm at a point where I say you actually ship faster because you empower your users to help fix things or build products and build features. And so from a pure, um, like, the fastest startups are the ones that, that most likely hit product market fit because you, have, you just have a certain amount of runway. If you run out of runway, you shut down the business or you try and raise more funding. And so you really don't have that many options. Um, and also once you hit product market fit, it's all about kind of protecting it and building it out and you're growing, growing the, the product. And so both for finding product market fit, but also growing the business once you have it, um, the speed of iteration is the most important one. So I think if you have a good community, if you have users, if you have a user base that's growing, um, but you only have one or two engineers, well, they will ask for a ton of stuff, for bug fixes, for features. And I think what I've seen with the open source community, um, and this is true for Cal.com, for Documenzo, for Formbricks, is if you empower your, your users, to become contributors and they can actually, you know, come in and, and contribute and maybe even get paid with, you know, Agora. Um, and I think that's just, you're beating every other company that has just two engineers. You have two engineers and 500 contributors, right? Mm -hmm. And so for us, um, speed has always been a focus, uh, but also, you know, um, speed internally as a core team. So we do have a, from the very beginning, we had a core team. Um, because you can also not just like rely on the community. Like you still need kind of like a, a red line, you know, like this is where we go. This is also like you need to become very good at saying no, because if you have a community, there's also people who want to take your product in a different direction or they want to, you know, uh, um, I don't know, want to put a button on the top right. And we're like, no, <laughs> like we don't put the buttons there. So I think having a really good core team that just really focuses on, on speed like I'm just getting shit done uh, beats everything. Um, and I think that's true for every startup. Um, and so when you're an open source, I think you, you, you can have a superpower, but of course also communities can be distracting. So make sure you, you really have your own way of thinking. Hmm. A quick follow up, if, if I may. Uh, so here, uh, for, for example, how do you think about this iterations so, uh, in sen the sense of, Let's say you're getting a lot of feature requests, especially if, if your uh, roadmap is uh, non-linear. You can try multiple things, but you don't know which one to implement first. Like, do you do you have some signals you observe, uh, you know, at, at your team level, uh, which we could take inspiration from? Um, it really depends on the stage of the the product. I think if you are building something like, say, fundamental, I think I would focus on features that reach the most people as they go live. As you grow up the business right now, we also, you know, let's say work with enterprise companies. Um, some of them make a, a quarter million a year in revenue. And so now you end up having a situation where you may have to prioritize those features. Um, but we, we kind of solved that by having, we, we split the team into kind of like a, a core team that just works on continuously core product. And then you have like a small, let's say, enterprise team that just like really goes into the, the more niche features that only one out of 100,000 people will use, but that person pays you a lot of money for it. Um, these features also typically end up 
if you have an open core product, which it means you have a, an open source piece and you have a closed source piece. It doesn't even have to be closed source, like all of our source code is open, but the, the uh, enterprise version is only source available. Um, and I think to me, you know, the day-to-day -day engineer doesn't need that single feature that we just shipped for this one single customer. Mm -hmm. And so um, you, you kind of end up building a, a open source team, you know, like an open core team, and then the more like the closed core team. Uh, and, and you want to empower them to, you know, of course, move as fast as you can. Yeah. So I think making the decisions um, in the early days, it's really just, you know, getting to market quick and, we, you know, we, I'd say by the point of version three, I think every component has been like rewritten. Every, every database adapter has been rewritten. Every, like there's just so much, there's very little code today that's from, from the early days. So I think the main objective is, you know, get the V1 out as soon as you can, and then just keep, you know, V2, V3. We're actually about to launch V4 like in, in, a, in a month. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and just, you know, truly really keep, keep working and working closely with your customers. But I think the North Star is if you have a product that's really accessible for everyone, really focus on the features that like are actually relevant for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one last like follow up I have for, for this. So, uh, yeah, so we will keep building the features on, on, on a daily basis. Uh, but how do you align like the long-term mission towards this? Should we see as this long-term vision or mission as a fluid thing which could change? Or we should have like that one thing in mind. For example, I've seen like you want to reach a billion people. So is that like a fluid like vision or it, it keeps changing or is this one thing you're running uh, towards? Yeah, it's actually a great question. Let me share my screen. So we do have a handbook written um and i think the very first day we like before we wrote a line of code me and my co-founder were like okay if this becomes a company and there's a chance that this doesn't but you know every time you work on something you can consider okay, what happens if this actually becomes a thing mm -hmm. and the reality is if like if you're working on something you have to optimize for the best case you have to think okay what happens if this is actually a success because the chances are it's going to fail like 99% anyway. So like you don't need to prepare for failure because that's that's a default. Like what happens if this fails is not as interesting as like what happens if this actually works. And so I do recommend to spend at least one day to think about if what I'm working on today works, what does that even mean? Like is this going to be a billion dollar business? Is this going to be a bootstrap revenue cash, uh, like cash flow positive business? Um, and and, and by really thinking, you know, what if this actually works? Like, is this, going to be, is this going to go public? Is this going to be a large enterprise? Is this going to employ 500,000 people, you know? Hmm. You don't need to do that. Like, you don't need to know the answer, but like, what, is, what, what actually happens? Like, what happens if, the, if, if SpaceX actually sends someone to Mars, you know? Like, so, so you really need to think about, okay, what happens if, the, what's the best case of this outcome? And then you need to walk your way backwards. So our vision has always been uh, to connect a, a billion people uh, within the next 10 years. So we started in 21. And to me, that's something that is, you can grasp it. Like you, you know what a billion is and you can communicate what a billion is. And you also have comparisons. Email has reached 7 billion people today, right? SMTP has reached 7 billion people by today. Uh, WhatsApp has reached two, two and a half billion people today. And so it's not something that's like, it's, it is outrageous, but it's also like, you know, possible. And I think one of the best cases is we do that in the next 10 years. And so you start your way w walking backwards, right? And so if you have the mission, what's the strategy, right? Okay, so the strategy is building the right infrastructure for the web. It's being used by every startup, every Fortune 500 company, every government, you know, like you really need to, the same way WhatsApp is being used by every, you know, uh, person. And then uh, you can go, your, go even go even deeper and say, okay, what's the company-wide objectives? And, and, you know, of course, you know, building the developer uh, environment and, and grow, you know, deeper and deeper into enterprise and, and infrastructure. And then you can go, you know, smaller into business objectives, you know, make enough money to, uh, to offer our product for free, right? 
three is such an interesting concept because if you just ship something that exists today for free, people will think it's worse. Like if I open up a lemonade stand and I say lemonade is free, you probably sell next to nothing or at least less than paying two euros or dollars for it, right? It's very simple. People think what's free is bad. The way you change that percept percep perception is if people think what you're selling is very expensive, but you give it to them for free. Hmm. And the way to, like, I would take a free Tesla. I know Tesla is worth 50, 60 grand, but like if someone gives it to me for free, I'll be like, hell fucking yeah. So the way to achieve a free product is not to go out in the market and say, we're the free alternative to Calendly or we're the free alternative to Xero or QuickBooks. Like I would, if, <laughs> if someone tells me, please use a free QuickBooks, I'm like, no, I don't want to go to prison, right? Mm -hmm. So the way we achieve that today is we, we make enough money with infrastructure, with enterprise and larger businesses, so we can give the rest away for free. Um, and so that's like the key business objective and giving something away for free is how you can go back to your mission and say, okay, how do we reach a billion people? Well, it's pretty hard to reach a billion people if you have a product that costs $15 a month, right? That's just, that's just really hard. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you, you go back to how do we achieve this from a product point of view? You know, you, you need to have the best consumer facing product, right? Like even though we sell infrastructure, it has to become the best like, uh, consumer facing product. Um, and the great thing is, as we learn to, you know, work with consumers, we also build the best infrastructure. Um, it's kind of interesting how OpenAI has ChatGPT, but the real business right now is selling the infrastructure to, you know, uh, developers and charging for the API. They couldn't have done it in, a, in the way they do it today if they hadn't had a consumer-facing product where they could learn and improve their, their large language models. And then internal objectives, of course, you know, work as closely as you can with your customers, hire the best engineers. I think that's the startup 101. I think if you follow those steps, you'll, you'll be, uh, uh, you'll be in, in, at least in a good position. And then you can have like some, some monthly KRs. Like I'm not a big fan of OKRs, but at least like, you know, make them concise and say, okay, I want to listen to, to customers, plan engineering, uh, assign the best people and can just really consistently ship and fix bugs. Um, I think if you're onto something and you, you keep following that, I think you'll be fine. And then individual projects is also, you know, like uh, you, you chuck them down into, you know, small things that you can actually give to someone and say, okay, publish 100 videos, publish this, build this, uh, you know, more endpoints than, than others. And um, yeah, so everything at the end of the day goes back to this kind of like pyramid. Um, but the day one for you should be, you know, what happens if this actually works out? Like what happens if this actually becomes, you know, something that connected a billion people and then walk your way backwards of like, what do I actually need? Um, and this also really helped us to, to raise uh, a seed round in series A because you also want to figure out how you can actually communicate your vision. Because like, it's easy to build something just because you like it. But the moment you put yourself into like this mindset of like, okay, what happens if this actually works? You can like talk to others about like where you want to go and what, what you're thinking about, right? Um, and so highly recommend reading this. This is all public, uh, handbook.calocon. Um, and uh, yeah, this really helped us at least in the beginning to you know, align on incentives. It was a bit of a monologue. I hope that was answering your question. <laughs> helpful right. yeah that's helpful for sure uh yeah, i think i'll let others ask questions i have more questions but we, we can do that later <laughs> you can go you can go in the end again yeah. <laughs> cool should we talk about midday i'm very excited by the way beautiful website the rapper uh, on top of victor is uh, is my designer so uh, and co-founder <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean uh, super exciting uh, and also like super scary at the same time a lot of users a lot of um, uh, stars on github etc a lot of interest so basically my first question would be like if you would start over regarding open up your repository and go in public what are mm -hmm. your learnings from doing that uh, regarding like building the community as you mentioned you have the red line yeah. of your company your vision but 
I mean, it's hard in the beginning to communicate that because everything is like chaotic. You you need to fix all the fires and fix everything <laughs> in between, right? Um, right. So my my first question is basically, how would you communicate with a broader community your mission, but also how to right. work together? It's a huge mm. job that needs to be done. So. I'd say these are like three questions, right? So the first one is like, what would I do different when it comes to like the repo setup, I imagine? Yeah. Um, so we have a uh, new repo question mark. What was the second one? Uh, more like uh, you, you have this vision that you're communicating visually. Uh, I mean, that's also good for investors, but also for the whole community yeah. as a whole. Yeah. Uh, I mean, coming up with that, I mean, I have a vision in my mm. head and, and my, my mm. own vision, but. I need to basically communicate that in a in a easy way. Uh, mm -hmm. How to come up with that? Basically, how how did you come up with uh, reaching one billion per persons? Like, what mm. is the formula? <laughs> what is the formula? Uh, and the, was that the, was that all questions, or do you have another one? Uh, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but we can start with those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let me dive into the new report. So, um, mistakes. Yeah. Um, I, I would do a couple things different. So uh, when we were getting started, um, we really had no idea how to kind of like separate up, um, separate the uh, um, like the open core with the open core was closed. Yeah. And we actually had a um, we had a split repo where you had like github.cal.com uh, slash calcom and then kind of like, you know, cal.com. And yeah. we had a, which was open and so open source free. And then we had a clone, a fork of this was kind of like, and let's just call this one closed. Uh, closed. Oh, jeez. Uh, I mean, yeah. you know what I mean, uh, yeah. and and this was uh, this was what was running on uh, running on prot. Yeah. And as you may imagine, the moment you have two code bases, you have like tons of merge conflicts because you need to keep keep these in sync, and um, stuff would suddenly break because you introduce a new dependency in one thing and. Um, so we were doing this for like at least three months, and we realized this is just a freaking shit show. So yeah. we ended up going the, the GitHub route and I would probably recommend doing the same thing again tomorrow is with a EE folder, which is enterprise mm -hmm. edition. And the way you do this is actually kind of easy. So you just have a repo of, um, let me actually share my whole screen so you can see the rest. Um, so you actually start with a license at the top and this license here says uh, everything is AGPL or M MIT, whatever you want. However, yeah. there is content that resides under this EE folder. And you can have multiple folders because maybe you have an API, maybe you have a front end that's uh, under a commercial license. Yeah. And, and you can define this license in these folders. So if I go into this folder now, you'll have to see that there is a other license which is yeah. this one. And this one is just a commercial license, right? So yeah. now the risk is people can violate your license. And yes, this has happened before, but the people who violate your license are the people who would never pay for it anyway in the first place. So you're, yeah. you're not really losing money. It's just more like an ego thing, whether you're okay with that or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it's way easier, you know, to, um, to, um, to maintain. Yeah. Uh, so I would do that. We lost a lot of time doing that. Um, and uh, second, uh, I don't know, we didn't do many mistakes, which I think is a good thing. Um, yeah. But um, there's definitely things, you know, like um, there's many great automations, like there's Graphite. Yeah. There is mage.app, there is uh, sync.linear.com. Uh, these tools are just like really good to get your repo cleaned up um, and, and just focus on the business. We had no idea how to, you know, build certain CI, like workflows and CIs. We literally just try everything from scratch. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's great workflows as well. So CI, GitHub, 
actions. Yeah. Um, yeah, but like, I mean, again, um, this all doesn't matter if what you're building is not useful, right? So like, of course, of if course. you build something that's useful, uh, it, it's just a, a time sink. But like, yeah. do not, you know, come up with like your own fancy license. Like we literally took this from GitHub and we were like, sorry, yeah. GitLab. And we were like, well, they went public. So I guess this works. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't come up with what we did with like, you know, this split repo setup and syncs and, you know, um, yeah. keep it simple. I'd say that's the most important thing. Um, I guess the communication, the vision part, that's something I can't really help you with because like it's your yeah. business and I don't know where you want to take it. Um, yeah. But I mean, um, it. I think it's really also down to like, what's your ideal outcome for the business? Like, are you looking to build a large corporation with different people involved and you know, like, Hundreds. Yeah, I, I would say I, w I would like to rephrase the question a little bit. I mean, more okay. like commu communication regarding your company, like yeah. open star, open startup, open source, that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's it's sort of a brand by itself to communicate yeah. that. Well, to me, to me, it's, if I if I look at your business today, and to those who are unaware, midday, this is your business, right? Um, mm. And to me, it's 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 fairly obvious, right? Like you, 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 you focus on compliance, you focus on, you know, embed, embedded, you focus on infrastructure. Infrastructure. And typically you also have like integrations. So you have like an app store, app store play. Yeah. Why is this not, okay. And so like all of these things are amazing in open source, right? So for you to share the vision is to build, build the best financial operating system yeah. in the world. And then yeah. guess what? Linux is the best because <laughs> they open source. So like it yeah. really writes itself. And if you want to build, you know, the largest financial operating system, you probably need funding, community, contributions, yeah. app stores, app store content, openness, transparent, transparency, and trust. Right? Like it really writes yeah. itself. And now you just walk your way yeah. backwards, right? And then there you go. Yeah. Yeah, this is super good. Cool. Awesome. Who wants to go next? Oh, like I've, I'll start with like an. You were, you were muted. Go again. Uh, I'm I'm audible now. Yeah, you're you're good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the first question I had was sort of related to open source only. Today, I mean, I see like. There is a lot of AI AI based companies which are coming out and naming them open, like sort of open source just in the name of distribution. So, mm -hmm. if we if we look at like the role of open source, like in terms of distribution, my hypothesis is like for the sake of distribution, it doesn't make sense unless you have like a great product. So yeah, the question will go for like what's your take on Red Hat package distribution and analytics and sort of comparing like the story of GitHub and GitLab how it was before. Did you say, did you mention Red Hat? Red, you mentioned Red Hat, Red, right? Yeah, Red Hat. Yeah. Um, yeah, Red Hat is very interesting, mostly for being kind of like one of the first-ish open source businesses that really, really went well and, you know, went public, of course. Um, for those who are not, like, well aware of Red Hat, so Red Hat took a different approach. They actually didn't build their own technology. They were kind of like on top of Linux and they were making it like enterprise ready and they did all the, I mean, if, of course they built their own technology, right? What I'm saying is their core IP was not built in house. Calipcom was entirely built in house. And there's different, different commercial open source projects. Like you could take Bitcoin today or Nostra today, which is not built by you and build a commercial open source like uh, company on top. 
um, or you take Elasticsearch or I don't know, something else. Um, so I think what Red Hat was really mastering is having a really close connection to Linux and the Linux Foundation and you know, of course uh, Linux, ta um, ta uh, what's his last name again? Uh, Well, founder of Linux, Linus. And um, so they really mastered the whole licensing game and, and contributing back and, you know, uh, building lots of um, kind of like, um, yeah, lots of drivers for the ecosystem. And so it was kind of like a yin and yang, you know, like you had like the commercial part, which was bringing in revenue, which means more funding for Linux as a as an ecosystem. Um, and uh, that helped both organizations, both the Linux Foundation and Red Hat to, to become what they are today. So I think for us also as Cal.com, we want to build an ecosystem where multiple companies, multiple organizations can win. You know, you can be a service agency implementing Cal.com for local, whatever, barbers or local governments, right? Like we want that, we want to promote that. And a lot of closed source companies are very, tight knit on like, I want to own everything and I want to reap all the benefits. But I think if you, if you take a look at WordPress, for example, like WordPress would not be the, the thing it is today if it was closed source, like all the plugins, all the web agencies um, using it in their technology stack because it's open source. I think that's really valuable. Um, you mentioned something about AI. Uh, is this referring to like, to like ride a wave and like not knowing what to build, but you want to be part of the AI wave or, or was that a different question? Uh, uh, um, so I'm building like sort of AI employees that integrate with human knowledge workers. And mm -hmm. recently the primary, primary like thing I've been dwelling about, like should we create an open source agent framework where people can create their own customized agents, but uh, yeah. doing that for just for the sake of distribution doesn't make sense, right? So yeah, I was I was like reevaluating on like the Red Hat package distribution, how they did it back then, because yeah, they mm. are the pioneer of it. Yeah. So, so sort of like the question comes around like the like the flywheel of like role of like open source versus closed source in terms of AI yeah. innovations yeah. and uh, should should one do it just for the sake of distribution? Well, um as you may imagine, um open AI was open source first, went private got a lot of sh shit for it. Um, and I think in the next year we will have equal or better open source large language models than OpenAI. Um, and I think this will keep, you will keep seeing this in all industries. I think there is an advantage to be first closed source, but there's not really so much protectable knowledge, right? Like people move between companies and and at the end of the day, even OpenAI is a, a bunch of open source things like connected together, <laughs> like the transformer is open source, the, uh, the, 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 the data is, is scraped from the web. So yes, there is some secret sauce somewhere, but I think it's only a matter of time until people find it and open source it and, and commoditize it. So if you, find, if you find something today that you think you have a competitive advantage, it's only a matter of time until you don't have it anymore. And so for me, um, there's not going to be a second open source scheduling product next to me because it's, it's a really, I mean, maybe there, there are like two or three open source alternatives to something, but it's a very much like when you compare to all the other scheduling tools out there that are closed source, I think it's like, I wouldn't call it the winner takes it all because the winner takes actually nothing, everything's free. And so for you as a, as a developer, you're like, well, why, why would I start a new repo if this exists? Like developers only build it themselves if they can't get it for free. <laughs> um, and so if that's what you're going for, you know, if, if you want to build a, a really large impactful piece of infrastructure, I think you have to be open source today. If you want to, again, build a small profitable boutique um, bootstrap business and you sell something uh, because you have some, you've built something that others don't have, um, you're probably fine being closed source. Um, I would never start a company just like open source for distribution because I think you're doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. Um, for us, there was never a, a point of questioning whether we should be open source or not. It was always very clear. And also the way we run the business, you know, with everything public and Calicom slash open and handbooks. Um, it's really hard to like, 
say, oh yeah, we're open source, but that's like more marketing. Like I, that doesn't go well with employees, with investors, with customers. Um, and people realize that quite quickly. I think there are like some examples where like, I don't want to, I'm, I'm a big fan of Skiff. I used it for a long, long time, but like, I do think there are still components out there that are not open source. And so you're kind of like in the, in the messy middle, you, you have like this open source mm -hmm. angle, but, but then some of the backend is still closed source. So you can't really fully use it. Um, and now it's like, is this an open source company or is it not? To me, open source means if we die as a company, if we get acquired and shut down, like nothing happens. But I do think apps like these like stop working as far as I know. I don't think you can like run Skiff locally today. And that's really sad. Again, I, I'd love to get in touch with them and see if there's a way to, you know, uh, like save that. But um, you really o only open source if the company or foundation, whatever, changes hands or shuts down. Um, and so if, if, if you have like a little bit of open source sprinkled on top of your, your product, it's not really open source. So it's not worth the hustle, in my opinion. Then just stay private and, and find another marketing channel. Yeah, uh, thanks for the answering that. I have like a second question. This is this is completely mm -hmm. not related to this. I've seen like you also did on deck. I recently did on deck, mm -hmm. and uh, like yeah, apart from the program, the primary like question is like, how do you build like the ideal co-founder? fits because uh, i've been doing sort of trial and i feel it's like it's like the hardest job like yeah you know just coding and shipping things is way more easy than finding the right co-founder so mm -hmm. yeah how how do, how do you like detect like the ideal characteristics of ideal co-founder market fit how did you did it back your back your time i think it's um i think for for a tech entrepreneur it's uh it's very hard I think it's it's probably as hard or harder than uh, finding a girlfriend if you're single. <laughs> and when you're single, it feels like you'll never get a girlfriend because it's like it's so hard and it's, it's so it's 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 really. I mean, speaking for myself, I don't know about the others in the room, but and then it happens, and you find the right person, and you just know it, and you're like okay wow this is we're really vibing and after six months you're still vibing and after a year you're still vibing and um as an example um some people you meet in the first week and you just really like them right and some people you don't like them after a week <laughs> and uh, so it doesn't really take that much time and and as a personal reference uh, i met my co-founder uh he was pretty much one of the first five people on the wait list of our product. So I was working on it for like a weekend, like literally maybe 16 hours of work max and launched the landing page and sent it to some people and, you know, started collecting some interest. Um, and, and then funny enough, as you mentioned on deck, uh, my, my, my core business got acquired by on deck and I completely stopped working on, on Calenzo back in the days for like seven, eight months. And luckily I launched that landing page, otherwise we would not have this conversation, but people kept signing up for the wait list and keep bugging me and like, hey, Pierre, when can I help and when can I use this and stuff like that. And so I was like, oh, damn, I have a very good job now in full time and I don't want to work on this right now. So I reached out to people in my network and, and friends and families, but no one really was standing out. And I basically told them like, hey, like take this, give me 10% of whatever company you're incorporating, um, you, you'll be in the driver's seat. And uh, ultimately I sent a mass email to everyone on the wait list saying like, hey, there's a chance I'm gonna shut this project down, I have no time. Um, is anyone here who wants to like take over? And, and so one of these people is Bailey, my co-founder today. Um, and uh, from the very first day, we just like really vibe, you know, you do video calls, you work together, you, you contribute. Um, I was not really much involved. I just like kind of like handed over the keys. Um, but uh, I had this single, uh, con not contract, but like I had the single thing I told him, like, if this ever goes crazy and you want me as like a full-time person, right? Like, 
let's incorporate this and do 50 50 split and like i'll i'll catch up with you like if, even if you spend six months working before um i'll probably figure out how to catch up and so as things turn out he launches it on product time and it goes completely crazy and we were like okay should we do this should we incorporate should we you know build a business and, and you know go after this opportunity and he's like yeah let's fucking do it and so um i met him about a year after in person so we just really met online and we just like you know if you have two people in this room you could be co-founders right if you just end up working together and fighting um the good thing that people don't realize is you have vesting and really use that there's nothing wrong um talking to your co-founder and saying hey, i don't think this is working out the same way you should be doing that to your late relationship if, if things are not working out you don't owe anything to anyone um and, and and quitting early is the best thing than keeping something toxic uh, 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 alive and you could even say something like a two-year cliff like make it two years like for, that's not too crazy I know people who have a two-year cliff and, and six-year vesting or even more um, when you're building something really big because it it's just becomes a bit of a risk. We did something interesting when we raised our Series A because we raised the seed round in the first two months and then the Series A about eight months after or so in the same year, I think, or maybe in the next year. It was a different market back then, but also we were growing like really, really fast that I asked our lawyers to uh, reset our vesting, like just like the investors didn't ask for it. They could, they sometimes do, but I was like, this is way too fast. Like I want more time for us to figure things out because like, you know, as the company grows and then valuations increase and, and, and responsibilities increase, you still want to make sure that like, this is not all or nothing. And so uh, a lot of companies die with co-founder conflicts. And if you find a way to, you know, mitigate these, whether it's by contracts or just by just like working with someone for a longer term, like six months is a long time, right? Remember, six months is a long time to get to know someone. Um, and if you like someone after six months, you probably like them after 12 months. And you're NSF. People build. So go find someone who builds. So. I mean, I mean, in, in past two months, I have like four trials. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, okay, I have like two more questions. One was like, when you just started like Cal.com and you were just sending this, launched a landing page, you sent like the, like, hey, we launched this and people signed up for your wait list and then you thought of stopping it. But yeah, anyway, coming, coming to the primary question, what were like your user acquisition channels for the initial hundred customers? And uh, what was what was the story you sold to like your customers when they were they were getting onboarded? And the follow up question will be, what was the first like vision and story you sold to like like the investors when you were planning to like raise your first round? I mean, of course you sold like, hey, I want to reach like one billion people. But what what was the hypothesis of backing that? Okay, I'm gonna reach like one billion people, and I'm confident about it yeah i think that's like one of those questions where it's like asking someone who like won the lottery of like what numbers you picked i think there's just um the the startup industry if you've been in, in it for like 14 years it's um i think finding product market fit is really inevitable as long as you keep trying very fast with many projects and to me, I, I love the, the comparison to like playing the lottery because that's actually true. Some 19 year old, and remember Bailey was also very young when we, we started this, may play once and win the lottery. Like, like chances doesn't care how much you've played in the past. But the question is how expensive is your ticket? And the ticket is literally free. Like for you, it is literally free. If you, as, as long as you pay your rent and you, 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 you have food on the table, um, so the job is to play as many tickets as you can, right? So um, you build something, you launch it, it doesn't take off, fine, shut it down. You launch something else, you play another ticket and it may work mediocre, but it's not going anywhere. Maybe mediocre means you build it to 10K a month in revenue and you sell it to another company and you do something else. Um, 
I've probably launched over the past, and this is go, this is also true for indie hackers and bootstrappers, but I've probably launched a hundred products and three or two of them worked out. So there's like a 2% success rate. And I think this is true for every out- outcome. Um, some people again play once and win, but that's less likely. It's just less statistically likely. But um, I don't believe in people saying we use this strategy and we became wildly successful. This is never this is never true. Sure, there's survivorship bias. I can tell you things that we've done incredibly well, like shipping fast and sh- shipping a lot and ship and like really talking to customers. These things are always true. But every startup book talks about that, and you probably don't need that need to hear that again. But um, I really mostly believe in like fundamental pivots where you try as many things as you can in a good short amount of time. Yeah, cool. I completely uh, yeah, agree with you. Yeah. So, there we go. There's another person joining. I know we only have one minute left, so I don't know if, if this is... Sorry, I, so I sent you. I sent a new link in the calendar invite. Um, sorry, you didn't. You didn't catch that. Uh, yeah, I did. I didn't see it for some reason. Hi guys, hi everyone. <laughs> We're about to close the office hours, but um, it's okay. I think I have. <laughs> I have time for one more question. You said uh, you had a follow up question, Charan. Oh, one second. I'm muting. I don't know if you can mute yourself. Can you, or is it just me as an admin? I don't know. Yeah, go for it. Oh, I think now you're actually muted because I don't hear you. Nope, nope, nope. You're not, you're not muted on my end. Anyone Wait, else here? No. Is, 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 no, is there you go. Sorry, sorry. About okay. That. Sorry about that. Hell yeah. So that thing you've just mentioned that you've tried multiple products and you've landed up on like two or three. Uh, let's say, what are some two or three reasons uh, you've learned from all of those, let's say, uh, fa- failed products or, or something like that. W- what are your takeaways f- from them? Well, they clearly didn't solve any problem. Um, mm. And if they did solve a problem, it was not an exciting problem to work on. And I go back to this, like, what, what happens if this actually works? For example, um, the previous project that kind of worked, um, was a, a hiring marketplace and it was pretty profitable. It was growing um, from zero to like maybe 10, 15K a month in revenue, like fairly quick within like two months. But it was also in the hiring industry and recruiting. And I was like, am I going to be a founder of a large hiring marketplace? And when you really sit down and you think of like, okay, is this going to be like where I want to spend all my time and all my energy on? And then you realize, well, I mean, while this is a fun project, I don't think I want to do this for the rest of the next decade or 10, 20 years. I mean, we're still entrepreneurs. We can always, you know, change gears. But to me, that was the moment when I'm like, okay, how do I make the best of this? Right. So you also want to be very picky. Like, for example, if I, if I, if I were to like not work on Cal.com, I would be very, very particular about the problem I'm solving, right? There could be, there could be a new technology coming around the corner. AI is everywhere in the streets uh, and in the sheets. But if there is not a problem that I really, really want to solve, even though I may have found something that could solve a certain problem, but I, I really don't care about that problem, I would not touch it. Like I would give it to someone who likes that product, like problem, I would probably sell the technology early on or, or I don't know, like give it to them for free. But as an example, right, like uh, AI, like it's really easy to think of like, oh, what can AI, what else can AI do, right? And if you follow that line of thinking, you will end up in a bad industry because you will end up something solving that A, maybe should not be solved, B, can be solved, but I'm not interested in the, in the solution. And C is like, you will probably not find product market fit because you don't know the problem. You know a solution, but you don't know the problem. You don't have the problem. And if you don't have a problem, you can't solve it easily as if you have a problem and you solve it, right? Um, and so I'd be very, very careful of following uh, a, a technology if you don't 
know the problem at its core. And to me, going back to, you know, my previous business, I was building a marketplace to connect recruiters with, with employees or contractors, and I had no good scheduling infrastructure. And so the reason I built this open source repo is I'm building a marketplace. I don't want to deal with time zones and calendar APIs and scheduling and cancellations and rescheduling and video. I don't want to be dealing with that. So let me open source this so everyone can like contribute and help and use this thing while I focus on my hiring marketplace. That was the idea. And if I didn't have this hiring marketplace, I wouldn't have thought of scheduling infrastructure, which, you know, now I spend my waking hours thinking about um, and so for me, it was really easy to, to figure out, okay, what do I need? How do I build this? What, what do other people need to, to get to the point where I am today? Um, the interesting thing is now when you have a product, now you can think of like, okay, how can I infuse things with, with like a large language model? For example, we, we, we recently launched a phone, a phone agent that can, you know, make bookings in my calendar. That's freaking dope. But if you don't experience the pain first and you wake up tomorrow and say, let me build a large language model to interact with a calendar because I think it's kind of cool, you will never fall in love with the problem. You'll never understand the problem as much as someone who works from like first principle. Cool. Silence. <laughs> um. Yep, I, I think that that's uh, all the questions. I think like maybe one small thing, like um, can can you tell me the, about this phone agent because we, we are working on something internally. Maybe we could like collaborate on that. Uh, so I'll maybe throw your email after after the, after the call. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. yeah, shoot me an email. Yeah. I have my email now. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is fun. Um, excited for the the next week's. Um, I don't know. Has anyone signed up for the next week or just this one? Just this one for now. Think just this one. Yeah, I, I've seen a lot of different emails signing up. So just curious if someone has book follow ups, but um, cool. Well, again, uh, my DMs are open. My emails are open. If you have any other commercial open source question, uh, happy to follow up here. Um, this is all live. So feel free to rewatch if you miss something <laughs> and catch you all next time. Yep, sounds great. Cool. Thank you. Take care. Everyone. Bye.